everybody. Welcome to another episode of That's a Fact. I'm your host, Kirsty Adams, and this edition will be the opera edition. And featuring in this episode is opera production expert, Elizabeth Manduel. I wouldn't say expert, say. but okay. <laughs> <laughs> Elizabeth, we are dying to know a little bit more about you. Let's have some more information about you as you introduce yourself in terms of what exactly it is that you do in opera. My name is Elizabeth Manduel. I am officially 26 years old, nearly said 25 there. Um, and I'm an, a resident assistant director. What that means is I work for an opera company as their assistant director for any production that comes up, whether it's a touring production or whether it's a local production. And it also means that sometimes I do get to direct my own stuff as with Pearl Fishers and hopefully some things next year. Um, I actually studied an opera performance degree at UCT and I didn't really intend to go into directing, but the universe showed me different. And I actually really enjoy the directing and the production part of it, as well as the singing, but more so the directing. And yeah, I got introduced to opera by my grandfather, um, but I really sort of developed more of a love for it while I was in high school and my singing exams had to be on operatic or classical pieces. And I gradually just started to love them more and more. The more I sang it, the more I got into it. And eventually I just thought, you know what, this is what I'm going to study. This is what I'm going to do. This is going to be my life. And that's kind of how I am, where I am. Thank you for that beautiful introduction. Uh, we are going to jump into the next part of That's a Fact episodes. And as you all know, we go into what is called a virtual women's circle regiment, where we ask questions and the guest is uninterrupted when asked these questions and they may express themselves however the hell they want to be expressed or express themselves. Gosh, my grandma just went crazy there. All right, so we are going to start with the first question and that is simply just Elizabeth, what made you go into opera? At first, it was just, I think the more that I fell in love with it, the more that I realized that storytelling is so universal. And I think that a lot of people come and see opera or have preconceived ideas that opera is for a very upper class white European audience or Western audience. And the more that I get into it, the more that I studied it, the more that I sang it, the more that I researched it, it just seemed so universal. The stories can be found in any context. The emotion that's portrayed can be found in any human. These experiences are human experiences, whether they are humans that are from a Western world or from an African um, background, the emotions that people express and in such a raw way is just profoundly a human experience. And I really enjoyed the universality, the universe, what? <laughs> and I really enjoyed the way that it could transcend all ages, genders, races, political situations, social class. And that's something that really speaks to me. Um, at every time, I know it sounds weird because you'd think I love opera and therefore I'm going to go into it. But the more that I discover about it, the more I love it even more. Um, if that makes any sense. Uh, mm -hmm. It's always got something new to add. And there are always new compositions which are being added about even more current situations, which just shows you that it's just such a universal language. And I just find that this, yeah, the, the raw emotions of it, the fact that the music can transcend language barriers. I mean, you've got operas in Italian that will render people to tears, even if they don't know what's going on, purely just based on the music of it. And that, that just speaks to me because emotions should be, you know, emotions and storytelling are so intertwined that they should be able to cross barriers and speak to everyone. What do you think are the keys to successful opera production? Everyone needs to be on the same page. Everyone needs to understand the story that they're telling and the concept, whichever, whoever the director is, 
whoever the choreographer is, it helps if everyone's on the same page and understands the concept that they're adding to that written opera. If you decide to take an opera and say, the subject is this, but the hidden subject or the hidden message that we'd like to tell is this. If everyone's on the same page, you're going to be able to tell that story a lot better. I think it's important to make sure that, of course, the musicality is on point. I find it's very pertinent to make sure that the emotions that your performers are relaying are precise and easy to read. Because despite the fact that it may be in Italian, French, German, it might even be in Afrikaans or East Prasa, if someone doesn't understand that language, even if they're reading surtitles and translations, they still need to be able to understand what's going through a character's mind as they're singing a passage. I like to see thought processes occurring on stage. I like to see someone go from anger to realization, to understanding, to sadness, to sort of helplessness. You know, an audience likes to see that that's how we connect and it aids to that storytelling. I think the storytelling is potentially the main focus of any production, but you wanna make sure that your audience feels satisfied that they've been taken on an emotional and musical journey with you I think it helps if you can touch your audience. And I, I think it helps that if you can tell a story that is conceptualized in a way that your audience is not familiar with, if they can then relate to that by the end of your production, that's going to help them open their minds. If you are doing a production of Bohem that's set in a township to an audience full of people who live in Bishop's Court, but they can grasp the sheer raw emotions that are occurring in that production, then you've accomplished something. And I think the success in any opera is to have accomplished something. What is the most important thing to remember when going into opera production? What's the most important thing to remember when going into an opera production? I think the most important thing you have to remember is your end goal. Um, Whether your end goal is to make your audience believe in your cause, whether your end goal is to make your audience feel happy or for everyone to feel that they've participated on a project that aids them or betters them in some way, or whether your end goal is simply to honor the piece that's been written. it just as long as you've all got that mindset and you've got a clear path to that end goal that's sort of what you want to keep in mind some some directors or some producers when putting together a production want your end goal to be that your audience walks out of the auditorium after the show and goes i want to discuss this because this social political thing was discussed and don't you think it's incredible how this happened and oh but did you notice how the artistic vision also implemented you know some directors want you to go out and have an intellectual discussion afterwards um for example when i directed pearl fishers my end goal was purely for the audience to sit and enjoy two and a half hours or two hours of beautiful music and have the ability to forget what was going on outside because it was in the middle of COVID. It had been over a year of lockdowns. Everyone was going through a tough time. And the Pearl Fisher's music is so beautiful that it it just, there was this dreamlike quality to it that I wanted the audience to be able to just sit there and forget their troubles. And I'm happy that, you know, we managed to accomplish that even if it was only for two or three people or if it was for the full 200, I don't mind as long as I manage to accomplish that for someone. So it depends on what you want your end goal to be, but if you've got clear vision and you've got a clear path on which you want to focus, I would say that's your, your, key, your key thought about preparing for something like that. What is your commentary on the male-dominated dynamic of opera. 
So, I mean, historically, in general, your conductors, your directors, your producers have mostly been men. I mean, pre-women working, all of that would have been done by men. Female opera singers, it wasn't necessarily considered a wonderful job to have. Um, They were never sort of high ranking in society. An example where you can see that is actually if you've watched Bridgerton and the female opera singer, Sienna, she's not considered high society. She's considered working class because she would be working as an opera singer. So it's quite interesting that historically, you know, your, your main directors, composers and conductors have been men. And because a lot of our operas that are popular from the 17th and 18th century have all been sort of composed by men, there's a very male gaze view and outlook on females and female characters. There are some composers like Mozart where you have some very strong, almost terrifying characters like the Queen of the Night. And then on the other hand, you also get these very wimpy characters um you know these very sort of two-dimensional female characters for example in Cosi Fan Tutte the two sisters are presented as naive and gullible and pretty much very stupid um and fall for anything and have no heart or third dimension yet the Despina character also in Cosi has a little bit more oomph and strength to her so there's always a kind of balance you have to find between looking at a character who's been written as two-dimensional and giving her depth or being given a female character who has depth but might not necessarily be able to resolve that in a in a just or um yeah in a just way Um, The best sort of example I can give to that is, for example, with Despina. She's a very strong character. She's obviously got some history, which we cannot tell because it's not written in the story. Uh But her ending at the end of the story is very much sort of she loses. She loses everything. She she gets tricked. She gets double crossed and she's sort of stuck with the consequences of everyone else's actions, which I would say is unfair, considering that she's a female in a man's world. Mm -hmm. And you find that in quite a few operas, there's always some reason why the strong female character will end up dying or just not being given the ending that they deserve, I find. Um, And then, yeah, like with, I mean, Pamina in Magic Flute is, you know, starts crying and says she's going to kill herself because the guy that she likes doesn't talk to her. Um, (laughs) And then, so so it's very hard, I think, sometimes dealing with uh, characters that are very two-dimensional and everything through a male gaze. Um, I think, though, the more that female directors are becoming more sought after or popular or there are more women in the production and directing side of things we're getting to see more depth we're getting to see more emotional conflict what's really interesting for me is seeing how people take a two-dimensional character and give her depth without having to give her um, a tragic backstory or um or an un or or a ridiculous sort of justification for their current state of mind. Mm -hmm. Um, I think there's, the the industry is moving in the right direction when it comes to having more female designers, female directors, female producers. Luckily, um, the company that I work for, there are women in pretty much at the top of every department, which is wonderful to work with because from stage management to costumes, to design, to production management, to artist management, to directing, there is a female input, which means that 
nothing that we ever put out there would ever be completely sexist, if I can put it that way. I've seen productions that are done recently where you've got male directors, male conductors, male producers, and then the one soprano or the one female character on stage is wearing the tiniest skirt. (laughs) And then everyone else gets to wear like full blazers and trousers. (laughs) So the industry is naturally moving in a very... Um, in a very equal direction. I think it's the job of companies such or larger opera companies that have more say and more input to sort of push that a little bit further. There are still um, a lot of people of the, of an older generation who would say that, you know, the reason there aren't female conductors is because they're just not cut out for it which is ridiculous. And by them combating that actively, your smaller houses or or just the general mindset of people who are going into the industry will gradually change. And I do think it's their responsibility to actively push that forward. Um, yeah. I think, I think the opera industry is... I think there are a lot of parallels that you can sort of construct between the operatic industry and maybe the film industry in that Me Too is an issue. It all it has been an issue and it most likely will be an issue continuing forward. But I think that the industry itself is moving forward and it is doing well for itself in that regard. Whereas I find that other industries potentially have a bit of a pushback on that. That was something. (laughs) Um, But what I can hear throughout this entire answer is, I love how I said entire, but what I can hear throughout this answer is that there was an evolution from completely male dominated to becoming more inclusive. And um, often when there is an origin space in which something is birthed, it's difficult to come out of those comfort zones, you know? Mm. It's difficult to come out of those comfort zones and explore new ways of doing it, right? Everything has to start somewhere, but it doesn't mean it doesn't have, it it can't grow, it can't flourish, it can't Mm. bring in more things. How would you summarize solutions for the problems that, you know, still exist within a male dominated opera space? So, like I said, I think that the major houses, for example, the Met, Royal Opera, have a duty to push forward, you know, entirely female produced productions. I think it would be not just a huge selling point, but it would be incredible to see operas from a different view. Um, anything that has, you know, anything that even your major operas like Carmen, Traviata, there's a definite female element there that sometimes gets overlooked. And I think it's the responsibility of those houses to promote things like that, to promote internships or opportunities for female conductors, female directors, female producers, and those sorts of jobs that are typically male dominated. Um, On a Me Too uh, aspect, because I have to touch on it, I think it is also the responsibility of houses to take allegations seriously. It's it's all very well to say, um, oh, we had no idea. And yet, in the meantime, everyone knows that the unwritten rule is you don't leave that man in the same room as a soprano alone. You know, and that is something that I've heard said. I have heard that said about people overseas, some very famous names that I will not mention, but the unwritten rule is he's not allowed to be alone in the room with a soprano or he's not allowed to be alone in the room with a female coworker. And it's the responsibility of those houses to take those allegations seriously. And if there is an unwritten rule about someone, maybe you shouldn't be hiring them. I genuinely think that the time has come 
for that, that sort of attitude, that mindset um, is not welcome in an industry like this. It's not welcome in any industry, but especially in an industry in which emotions and relations have to be portrayed in public on stage and have to be rehearsed where people have to be in close proximity to others, especially if you're going to be a performer that has to have a kissing scene or a lovemaking scene with a coworker, you want to make sure that they feel as comfortable as possible and that they know the boundaries and that they feel safe in that environment to do their work. There's no use in going, but they have a great voice, so just suck it up. It's, it's past that time. No one's doing it. No, no one should be dealing with it anymore. And it's the responsibility of those big houses to step up and actually say, we will no longer be working with this person because of this and this. Mm-hmm. And I think that as soon as, you know, on a Me Too space, as soon as those houses sort of declare that and people realize that rehearsal rooms are safe spaces, I think that more people would be willing to enter in other parts of the industry that are traditionally male dominated. Right on. I think there are so many things to flesh out from what you've just said. Um, But yeah, basically if I had to kind of bullet point this, it means to um, kind of, what's the word not dutify because that's not even a word but um basically make it a mandatory principle to tie in not even tie in to integrate the workforce between man and woman within the upper space that and making sure that there are boundaries that are clear when it comes to well it depends on what sexuality you are but in in both cases um making the boundaries clear of what it means to harass someone sexually um all of those respectful principles that need to be you know outlined and outlined in the most effective way because Mm -hmm. no one's going to be reading a manual and studying that manual stating a thousand principles right Mm -hmm. um there needs to be a very effective workshop that happens in order to address these issues right and like you said same page implement like implementing a rehearsal at the beginning of this of the rehearsal period to say that you two characters will be coming into close proximity with each other. What are you comfortable with? What are you not comfortable with? It's not Mm. that hard to do. A lot of productions that I've worked on, the singers sort of take that among themselves if they have to do that. And they'll say, I'm comfortable with you putting your hand here, but not here. But that shouldn't be on them to bring that up. There There should be someone who has the responsibility in the rehearsal room to say, you two have an intimate scene. You three have a situation going on. I'd like you to sit for 20 minutes and think about what you're comfortable with. And then I'd like you to talk to your group. And then I'd like you to tell me, because if a director doesn't know what someone's comfortable with and they go, so then you're going to grab her, you know, on this body part without knowing that that person actually has a situation with that body part. It's Mm -hmm. on the director, I think as well, to understand what, your performers are comfortable with and how to work around that or how to work with it. Mm. And I think that's something that male directors sometimes forget. They just say, okay, you're going to grab her by her upper arm and then yank her, obviously not too hard, but then she might say, oh, actually I've had a bad experience with that. Can we maybe try my wrist or something like that? And that's, it's, it shouldn't be on a performer to have to, tell the director um, actually can we change that because of this and this but if a director knows you know beforehand she says I don't like it when people grab my upper arm then they know cool so you're going to grab her by her wrist and then we don't ever have to make it an awkward situation we can just work with it or work around it and it's it's not that hard to implement it's just about dedicating 
45 minutes <laughs> even to hashing through those, making sure everyone knows what they're comfortable with and what they're not comfortable mm. with and going from there. What I'm hearing from this is also that this happens a lot. Um, the miscommunication between what is allowed and what's not allowed. And particularly with lovemaking scenes or intimate scenes, is it, am I right in saying that it happens often where um, one party will take advantage of the other um, simply because they are featuring together in an intimate scene? Uh, not in my experience. I'm going to be very honest in that everyone that I've worked with has been very professional and above board, but I can understand how it could be misinterpreted. I understand how some could take advantage of the situations. And I know that some have. Um, I know that that doesn't necessarily have to be a blurred line in who your character is and who the person you're working, you know, your characters and yourselves out of that character are two different people. But also when directors or conductors, you know, decide to implement a bit of power over your career, because the problem is, is that that power and that, um, that power gap and that power play is quite a regular thing or not regular, let me not say regular, but it, you know, it's something that exists because unfortunately in the operatic industry, as well as with the film industry, the modeling industry, mm. any kind of creative industry, it's not about what you know, it's about who you know. Mm -hmm. And the problem with that is that people will use that to their advantage, whether it's in getting favors or whether it's in abusing that power. Yeah. And unfortunately, I know of musicians who have had to deal with conductors who have, you know, tried their luck. I know of singers who've potentially had sort of power struggles with directors or conductors as well. Luckily, I've, I mean, I've never worked with anyone like that and I've never been put in that situation myself, but I know that it is something that, that occurs. To me, I see a pattern happening in many creative industries with taking advantage. And I sometimes wonder if it has to do with, you know, the freeing of emotion that these types of workplaces that are creative um, enable, you know, because I know that in places like, it's very easy to get handsy in a studio, a recording studio between two parties um, because there's so much passion being overflowed and passion being shared, passion being emitted into the, the energy space, um, whether it's music, whether it's fashion, whether it's art. Sometimes I wonder if that creative um, freedom can mm. be a little bit dangerous, you know? I, I wonder if it's an overflow of emotion, as in it's uncontrollable, or if it's taking advantage of the fact that you could call it professional work even though deep down you well know that it's not professional in any way in that I, I I think any situation that I might have witnessed or you know heard about has not been a oh he was so taken away by the music and everything that he you know it just happened and you know apologized off it's never been that kind of thing it's always been a uh, taken advantage of the fact that you could call it professional or to, you know, take advantage of the fact that it's work. Mm. And, you know, if there, there's, if then there's a sort of, Oh no, but don't touch me there. It's going, but you know, we're working. Like, wh what do you want me to do? And I mm -hmm. think it's more taking advantage of the situation. I think yeah. any, any person who does that knows that if they were working in accounting or anything else, that that would be inappropriate. Mm -hmm. So just because we're dealing with emotions doesn't mean that you have the leeway to be inappropriate. More of a gender concern. And that is that 
I've noticed obviously that people like Mozart probably took it was probably one of the people or so to speak or said to have taken advantage of his privileges of being the creator of the work and the creator of you know possessing an oeuvre of works Mm. um and when it comes to production and the actresses or the the singers the female singers that you know work with him and sometimes I wonder if this was like the genealogy of (laughs) um you know the the opera culture of still in a way preserving you know male dominance and male dominance abuse you know um and also another thing that I wanted to mention was that because opera started with male voices I sometimes wonder if you know, women's voices are seen as somewhat weaker. And I say this because I've, I myself know of composers that would say is such a thing, but why can't we move into a space where it is just seen as a characteristic, another characteristic, right? Um, because in reality, you know, the woman's voice can manage, you um, its own type of characteristics and the male voice can manage its own type of characteristics as well. Mm. So how do you deal with that in terms of um, sexism, I guess, and um, the discrepancy between the difference between, you know, male voices and women voices and how people can discriminate on that basis. Interestingly enough, I don't think we really have that. Um, That's great. I know it sounds really weird, but the only the real discrepancy between voices is not necessarily between male and female, but whether you have a more lyric or a more dramatic voice. Mm-hmm. So Wagnerian sopranos, for example, who are your Brunhilde, your Valkyra, your your very like sort of female goddesses, warriors on flying horses riding through the night, yeah. or your very sort of dramatic sopranos and very much listed as a force to be reckoned with, you know? And meanwhile, on the other hand, you can have your very lyric tenors like Mozart had for um, Tamino, whose first aria is Die Spielnis is bezaubert schön, means like this picture is the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. And it's this gorgeous sort of lyric line. Um, And I think that's more the characteristic difference that people use in opera in that you've got very strong dramatic women such as your queen of the night and your Wagnerian sopranos and yeah. your Torandot and your some of the Tosca you know your big Puccini dramatic yeah. sopranos but on the other hand you do have your lyric sopranos you do have your your Leila's your uh, Pamina's um, your very sort of sweet subdued or um, innocent if I can put it that way, not necessarily naive characters, uh, but you also have that in the men as well. You get these very dramatic tenors who are your, you know, your sergeant coming back from war declaring his love, but then you've also got a very lyric tenor, which can be your sort of softer romantic male character. So luckily I don't think we have a sort of female voices are weaker sort of situation. Because if you've heard of Wagnerian Soprano, that is not someone that I would ever call weak. (laughs) Fantastic. Um, And so I think think that's quite nice in that there's not a a strength sexism issue in when it comes to opera characters per se. Mm -hmm. Um, On your thing about Mozart, I honestly think that Mozart just let fame get to him and I would just say that he's like any rock star today bit of a you could say bit of a sort of like a Harvey Weinstein situation where it was just about having the power and just the fame not necessarily him you know just because he was the composer got to do that stuff it was yeah. just I think, you know, um, Mozart and I can't think if there are any other, I mean, Mozart's sort of the most well-known one to have been a bit, had a bit of a way with women, if you can put it that way. 
yeah. um, because I mean we don't know what the situations of those circumstances were but mm-hmm. um he's sort of the only one that I, that I know of that you know had a way with women and that's kind of just listed as a playboy immature sort of nonchalance situation mm-hmm. uh, I don't know every other male composer that I think of just I feel like, you know, little geeks sitting at their piano at home in the dark. (laughs) So so I don't think, I I don't actually know a lot about the personal lives of the the composers, but. Of course, we'll never know. I know that there are definitely some male producers, you know, from the 40s, 50s, 60s of opera who would have definitely Mm -hmm. taken advantage of their position if. Sure. If, you know, a young soprano or a young mezzo came in and, you know, they wanted a big career and they wanted to be the next Maria Callas or something, yes. I'm sure that there was an advantage that might have been taken there. But like I said, the film industry, the modeling industry, any of that, you're going to find it anywhere, really. Mm-hmm. As we know of um, of opera women opera singers in general um they are usually they usually have a bit more substance to their um to their bodies um and if you're not considered that substantial within your bodies it's just called voluptuous for for goodness sake um then you know some people might even question your your um what's the word your capacity to be able to sing um opera but that's not the case and clearly someone has proven that you know and then this, an this also equations. touches on sorry yeah. this also touches on an issue of um body um stigma and body um, expectations i mean mm. can you flesh on about that a little bit more i think i think the idea of you know it's not over till the fat lady sings trope um, is is a little antiquated these days. Um, Kalas was sort of, I mean, she was told to lose weight as, I mean, opera singers today are told to lose weight to look the part. Um, you know, opera is not what it was in the late 1800s where you would walk on, sing this aria and then just walk off. Directors mm-hmm. want you to jump around and dance and, you know, get up on the chair and then get onto the table and then nosedive off. So I think that since, you know, since the eighties about, I would say that fitness has sort of become more of the priority rather than the body shape or type that you have. Obviously, as with most things, you know, I think there are directors that want to work with flexibility and athletic ability in which Mm. case larger people will sort of be discriminated against for that. Um, But there's no sort of, I wouldn't say that it ever goes in the direction of, oh no, that person is far too skinny to be able to play the role. Um, Like I said, I think it's more about athletic ability these days. Um, Lots of opera singers that I, I sort of follow are, you would say curvy or voluptuous in today's body standards, yet their athletic ability is of that far greater than, you know, some regular sized people that you see. So I think directors are more looking for athletic ability and um, also um, sustainability, being able to sing six shows a week or something and having a body that can support you to do that without getting tired, without getting sick, fitness and health is sort of the main focus these days. So uh, whilst obviously there's always going to be some sort of body shaming aspect, it's, I wouldn't say it's as bad as the film industry, but you know, if you're going to apply for a role that is meant to be, if you're, if the role you're applying for is a 12 year old child, you're going to have to kind of look like a 12 year old child. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's, it's sort of one of those things. I, as someone, you know, who's hoping to direct many more operas in the future will never, you know, tell someone objectively to lose weight or anything, but 
Mm. If I want you to run a marathon whilst you're singing, because that supports my concept or the concept of the production and Mm. you take three steps and you're wheezing, unfortunately, it's obviously not going to work out. Um, the same way that you would prep for a role on stage, the same way you would prep for a dance show, anything like that. It's, it's more about health and ability Mm, than look, per se. And I suppose it's not supposed to be your job in the first place to look for that health factor or make sure that that person is taking the necessary health precautions. It's supposed to be part of your professionalism as a singer already to take care of your voice. Because your body, your voice is your body and your instrument is your body, you would take care of it the same way that a violinist does their violin. Mm. Um, You know, you would never leave your violin out in the cold for three days. You pack it away and you make sure the strings are loosened on your bow so that it doesn't, you know, the same way that as a singer, you would make sure that your lungs are working healthily and that you're not drinking too much alcohol because it dries out the vocal cords you would make sure that, you know, you're not damaging your voice by screaming and shouting in the car. Mm. Um, so it's it's professional responsibility, the same way an athlete would take care of, you know, the body parts that they need to do what they're doing. And yeah. any musicians would take care of their instruments. Absolutely. And on that note, oh man, I, I know lots of people that would say, that was such a pun (laughs) but on that note I think we will end healthily um, with our conversation and say that basically your insight has given us a lot to think about um, in terms of the creative industry in not just in opera but in general and it's just given us a window into you know what actually goes on there and what we can improve for the betterment of our womanhood within these creative industries. As per tradition, with that's a fact, we always end with an affirmation, um, whether it's for yourself or for the audience. So I will be happy to guide you through the process and start, um, start the affirmations. So for this episode, my affirmation will have to be Clarity is, no, 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 no. Let me recite that. My affirmation will be um, being on the same page is key. And that's a fact. Okay. Um, My affirmation would have to be always be yourself no matter what. And that's a fact. Yes, honey. 